Hello everyone, semi-retired Bob here. I talk about the carnivore diet, all things related to the carnivore diet, and miscellaneous odds and ends. As most of you know, Dante Ferrigno is who I first found to get me started on the carnivore diet. And of course, finding him led me to Dr. Barry. So Dr. Barry is who I give the most credit to for my carnivore diet journey. When I was ready to start walking September 1st of last year, my main motivation for getting movement in was following a guy named Coach Bronson. And I am super excited. We have Coach Bronson with us today to answer a few questions for us. So let's jump right into this. I hope you enjoy this as much as I enjoyed finally getting to speak with Coach Bronson. We have with us today, Coach Bronson. It is such an honor to speak with you, sir. For those that don't know you, although I can't imagine anybody that watches my channel, as much as I talk about you, doesn't know who you are. But go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you got into the keto slash carnivore lifestyle. Yeah, that's okay. There's a lot there. We could do we could do a whole hour just on, on the background. Um, I'm Coach Bronson. I've been coaching for a little over 12 years uh, in health and fitness. I started out in fitness got into nutrition along the way and been doing carnivore and coaching carnivore for about five years now. Um, I got started on this, this whole journey was really a process of uh, uh, realizing that I wasn't in reality, the person I thought in my head. Right. So I grew up, I was kind of, I was in shape, you know, when I was growing up, I went to to school, lifted weights, was active, did sports, joined the army, did all these things. And then I got married and average middle day, every day, sitting at a desk behind a computer life caught up to me. I wasn't active anymore. I was eating like crap. Um, I had gained a ton of weight. I had acne. I had IBS. I had urgent bowels. I was not going anywhere. I was depressed and just overall, just kind of not living my best life. I'll just put it that way. Right. Uh, I was faced with the visual. Sometimes everybody needs that one thing that makes you go, wait a second, something has to change. Sometimes it's small things that build up over time. Sometimes it's a combination of those small things. And then one big thing happens. Sometimes it's somebody in your life having a, a, an intervention. Sometimes it's somebody in your life having their own issues that make you realize that you're going to be where they are if you don't change what you're doing now. So there's a lot of different things. Everyone comes from a different place and has different experiences. But for me, the straw that broke the camel's back was seeing a picture of myself that my daughter took of me at the beach about almost about 15 years ago or so. And, you know, I'm in my mid to late thirties. Um, I'm feeling in my head, this is where we talked about identity in my head. I still connected who I was with the young fit, guy in the army could do anything and take on any challenge. And then I saw this picture of me at the beach and I was like, wait a second, that's not who that guy is. That guy has got a gut hanging out. That guy has man boobs. That guy looks uh, absolutely horrible compared to what I thought in my head. You know, I took my shirt off and I'm thinking, yeah. And then I saw my picture and I was like, oh no, that is not what I had that's not that's not who I who I am. That's not who I am here. And that's not who I want to be in real life. So that is the point where I, I and it wasn't an overnight change. And I don't want anyone to think that the expectation is something's going to happen. You're going to change your mind. And then all of a sudden overnight, everything's better because it doesn't work that way. But something has to get you started in the direction you need to go in the direction that you want to go. And for me, it was an eight year journey. It wasn't until it took me about eight years to find the right combination of things and to do things consistently and get to the point where I could reach a level of health and physical freedom that then I could open up the doors to living experience, living life and experiencing the things that I want to without having any limitations. So an eight year journey got started with me looking at myself on the beach going, that guy's a fat ass and he needs to change. And it started with French fries, then it went into alcohol, then it went into this, and then it changed into working out regularly. And it, I, like there was a process of a bunch of different things that changed along the way. 
it took me years to find that carnivore was the best way for me to eat if I wanted to be healthy. It took me a year. It took me. It was easier for me on the fitness side. I found CrossFit about a year and a half, two years into the journey, and that completely changed my life from a fitness perspective. I found a fitness program that did everything that I needed it to do. Um, it helped me feel like that young, fit, energized kid again. Uh, and then that lasted for about five or six years. And then I hit a wall. I started gaining the weight back, trying to figure out what's going on. I'm, I'm a CrossFit coach. I'm a gym owner. How come I'm getting fat and overweight again and feeling like crap and getting hurt and can't do all this stuff? And I feel like I, I saw a picture of myself again. It's the visual for me. I saw, again, I'm at a pool party with members of my gym who I'm responsible for helping them get in shape and get healthy. And I saw a picture of me on the diving board and I'm like, oh my God, that's the same guy from six years ago who was sitting on the beach. What is going on? Now, I was in better shape. My physical ability had improved. Okay. I was stronger. I was faster. I could do more things, but my IBS was still an issue. My urgent bowels was still an issue. I had lost a ton of weight. And then I guess what? It was coming all back again. And I still had chronic now. And on top of that, because now I'm being physically active, now I'm also dealing with chronic injuries. And I thought it was the intensity that I was working with. And what I didn't realize is it was the inflammation that I was causing from the food I was eating. The minute I went carnivore, not the minute, obviously not the minute, right? But essentially within 30 to 60 to 90 days of going carnivore, everything completely turned around. My IBS urgent bowels was gone. My aches and pains were gone. Chronic injuries that I had been dealing with for years just completely disappeared. And I was able to go from working out two or three days a week feeling horrible to working out four or five, six days a week and feeling fantastic the entire time. My recovery improved. Everything got better. I got stronger. I got faster. And I started looking like, hey, that guy probably owns a gym because I started looking fit. Right. I had the, the fitness down. I added the nutrition and everything came together. And that's my my story in short. So you would say that the nutrition got your your metabolic health back on track. I've heard you talk about this a little bit on your channel here and there. Mm -hmm. Um what is metabolism? We always hear people talking about what is metabolism. Yeah. Now, I yeah. know we don't have five hours to talk about this stuff today, but if you could give us just your quick overview of that, and then we'll get yeah. on into some more specifics. So there's two parts to that. One is uh, my nutrition helped me complete the puzzle, but it did not fix my metabolism. It helped improve my overall uh, solution to fixing my metabolism because fitness was the first part for me. Some people start with nutrition and they get to a point and they hit a wall and then don't know why things aren't going as far as they want it to go. And it's because they're not doing things physically. For me, I did it the other way. I started physically and then I realized I needed to do something on the nutrition side. So there's a two, there's, it's, it's a 50, 50 equation for improving your metabolism. You need physical activity and you need proper nutrition. And what we talk about when we say metabolism, which is a very misunderstood word. And you're right, we could go for hours talking about metabolism, but to put it simply, metabolism, health, fitness, wellness, sickness, all of those are talking about the same things. It is the function of your body, period. So how your body functions is determined, well, is, is all of the different pieces uh, mechanisms that we like to talk about that make everything happen. So your digestive system is part of your metabolism. Your uh, immune system is part of your metabolism. Cardiovascular system, part of your metabolism. Your, muscul your musculature, your skeletal muscle, your bone structure, your ligaments, your tendons, your hair, your eyesight, right? Your spleen, your append, all of these things, everything in your body is part of your metabolism. Your metabolism is the sum of all of the functions that keep you alive. And when those things are working, we are healthy and we are fit. When those things aren't working, we are sick and we have disease. 
So that's really what we're talking about when we talk about metabolism. Metabolism is not, I'll reach, say, I could say this a million times, metabolism is not, has absolutely nothing to do with burning fuel. Burning fuel is a necessary component that we need in order for our metabolism to function, but it is not our metabolism. It is not, it does not define metabolism, which a lot of people don't understand. As you have said many times on your channel, because metabolism is how well your body is functioning. One yep. of the things that you talk about a lot on your channel, I've attempted to explain it a couple of times to my folks. I'm now glad you're here to do it in person. <laughs> What is functional fitness and how oh do we goodness. make it go? Yeah. Okay, functional fitness. So it's super, it's, uh, let's say it's it's a simple thing to understand. It can get complicated when you talk about how do I do it, but then we talk about 1% and that makes things easier, right? Just 1% more every day. But functional fitness to uh, make it as easy to understand as possible, it's just doing whatever you can to improve your ability to live your life. That's functional fitness. Whatever you can do to improve the things that are currently limiting you in your daily life is improving your daily function. So that's how we can look at functional fitness. Uh, if we look at the industry standard, if we look at what you know society or the fitness industry calls different types of things, we can get sidetracked. And it's the same with nutrition. When we talk about different types of carnivore, different types of keto, different all, none of that stuff matters. I'm trying to improve my health, so I need to figure out what things are going to work for me. And the labels that other people put on how they do things mean absolutely nothing to me. So functional fitness for the individual is anything that's going to help improve their function in their daily life. Now, there are some concepts and principles that are basic to pretty much all human beings when it comes to what those things are. And that starts with your movement. What are the movements that most people need to do? And then we get, we talk about the seven essential movements. So most people in order to get about their, do, go about their lives, get about their house, do the things in the yard, play with their kids, play with the grandkids, do their chores, whatever you have to squat, which if you're sitting in a chair or sitting on a toilet, you're, you have to squat. Okay. Lunge, walking up and down stairs is lunging. Walking is a type of lunge. Okay. If you have to, Bend down and pick something up. Often getting into a lunge to do that is is is, is a way to, to make that happen. Um, hinging, bending at the waist, bending down to pick something up, picking a box up, right? Anything like that. Um, we have pushing things. We have pulling things. We have carrying things. And then we have twisting, which is managing the your, your spinal um, stability and, and safety, right? So core strength. Right. So there's seven things that everybody needs to work on on a regular basis, because if we're not working on if we're only working on walking, that's great. Walking is great as an activity in general. If it's getting you outside, it's getting you fresh air, it's getting you sunlight, it's getting you vitamin D. It's not helping you overall in your functional movement. And that's what's super important. You need to squat and deadlift and lunge and push things and pull things and carry heavy things and do these things that are challenging because they help support your metabolic function from not just moving your body and keeping that range of motion, but maintaining all the different muscles. We have muscles all over our body and we have to use those muscles in all the different ways that they're meant to be used. And those seven essential movements engage the muscles in all the different ways that they, that they need to be engaged. So we keep them stimulated so we don't lose them. One of the things I've I've saw your discussion with Miss Kelly Hogan. Yes, about, love Kelly. I do too. You two were talking a lot about high fat versus high protein carnivore. Yep. And it seemed to me like you two basically agreed you were sort of talking about the same thing, just coming at it from different angles. Yeah. So would you mind talking about that for just a little bit? Yeah, yeah. It's uh I think we all start in different places. And I went through a phase when I was first coming up, I was like, um, it's all about the protein. And I still think it is all about the protein. And I think Kelly started with, it's all about the fat. We've come to realize over time, as most good coaches do, you start realizing that what works is more important than what you believe. There shouldn't really be a belief system. Anybody that talks about or uses the word, this is what I believe when we're talking about, um, 
science or how things work when it comes to health and fitness, um, be wary because they're not talking about the reality of what works. They're talking about what they think works and it's likely that they've got nothing to back it up. So when we talk about the evidence of what we see as coaches working in our clients, you know, we look at, Hey, so-and-so is doing better with a little bit higher fat than their protein. And this other person's doing better with a little more protein than their fat. So maybe there's something going on here. What is going on? And you have to look at where are they, where have they come from and where are they trying to go? Are they sick? Are they fit? Are they lean? Are they obese? Do they have autoimmune? Do they not? Do they have this? I mean, and there's so many different things to look at that the trial and error of sticking with one protocol because you think that's the right way to do it is going to set you off track at some point because your body may not be in the right position for that protocol to work. But when you and when you jump from this protocol to that protocol, one of the biggest things I see all the time is people like, I'm going to go high fat. Well, that didn't work. OK, I'm going to go high protein. Well, that didn't work. Now I don't know what to do. Well, there's a whole spectrum in between the two. Where's that? Why is anybody talking about that? And if we get away, and this is what Kelly and I were talking about. If we get away from the drastic hard line conversations around how much somebody needs, what's the right amount? That is a red hair and it's making people take longer to reach their goals. There is no right amount that anybody can tell you for fat or for protein. There are places that you can start that may set you up for success if you're willing to experiment and figure out from there what will work best for you. Okay. And a general guideline is for most people, you need around 100, 100, 100 milligrams, 100 grams of fat per day. And for most people, one gram per pound of lean mass is a good place to start of protein per day. Okay. So that's a good place to start for most people. Now, some people, if you start at 100 grams of fat, could you use more? Possibly. If you're coming at it from, I, I have health issues that I need this fat to help my body reset, repair, and do some things, okay? Clean up some oxidative stress, get rid of infl inflammation because fat is really great for helping that. Build some more brown fat, get my body fat adapted faster, all sorts of different things there. But at the same time, just because you need higher fat for whatever condition or situation you're dealing with doesn't mean you need less protein. The amount of fat that you need, the amount of protein that you need are not tied to each other. Okay, so if you are substituting or replacing or adjusting one of the macros in order to get more of the other, that's where a lot of people get messed up because they're thinking it's high fat, low protein or low fat, high protein or whatever. Let's stop looking at them as connected. It's how much protein does your body need? Your body needs protein for a lot of different functions, including hormone function. People don't, people, uh, something else I hear a lot of people going, what? Right. It's all but we always talk about fat for protein for hormones. Well, we have half of our hormones are made from protein. So if we're only focusing on fat for hormones, we're totally missing a whole bunch of them. And most of them are thyroid hormones. So you wonder why your metabolism is all whack is because you're some of your metabolic hormones aren't getting the protein and amino acids that they need because you're cutting down protein so low. Not to mention you're not building muscle and you're not maintaining your metabolic rate, things like that. So. We need protein. We need fat. They are both important and they are both individually measured and quantified by what your body needs. So I think that's really where Kelly and I both kind of come to. It's like, yeah, some people may do better on high fat. Some people may do better on high protein, but that doesn't mean the other two have to suffer. Right. Because if I'm getting protein, but I'm not getting fat, then I'm not getting all the nutrients from my protein. Right. Because most of the fat that we eat is used outside of energy is used because a lot of the nutrition in our protein sources are fat soluble. So if I'm eating lean meat all the time, number one, leaner, the leaner, the meat, the less nutrition there usually is. Number two, the leaner, the meat, it doesn't have the fat built in to help you get the nutrition that is in there. Okay. And then on the other side, if I'm getting a bunch of fat, but I'm not getting a lot of protein, then I'm just literally just cutting out most of my nutrition. Because most of the nutrition comes in the protein source, not the fat source. 
So you need them both in order to really optimize the whole picture. Now let's go on into some some more specifics towards my channel. I have a lot of people that are my age, which is 60. And like 45? 40. Oh, 60? Okay, sure. Yeah, I'm I am 60. I am older <laughs> than you. You know, I have to I have to pause here and say, you know, when I first saw you, yeah, I had no idea how old you were. How old you were. Yeah, I'll be, I, uh, I, I'm 51 I and a half. You, I know I but I had commented that I was following Coach Bronson I because I loved his stuff. And you know, I don't know how old he is, but he looks like he's a 25 or 30 year old. <laughs> So Thank I you. had no idea that you were not my age, but not that far behind. Not that far either. away, yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, what would you say to a senior that's just starting on this journey? They've just gotten, you know, they've lost their first 50 pounds on carnivore keto, whatever they're doing. Yep. And now they feel like they want to get up and start doing stuff to get Do the it. functional fitness. Yeah. What kind of things would you suggest to them to get started with? Yeah, I think the first thing is mindset wise, get your mind right about what you're doing and why you're doing it. So why do you want to get moving? What is it about your about this process that you want to get something going? Um, but more, I don't know about more importantly, but kind of just as important is the mindset going into it of we call it the beginner mindset understanding that it's a learning process and it's not going to happen overnight and setting expectations that are realistic. Okay. So getting curious with yourself, this is what I love. And this is one of the, the, the you can use this in, in a couple of different ways as you go about your journey. When you're first getting started, it's I'm curious, what can I do? Let's try this. Do I like that? Let's try this. Do I like that? I don't like this. I probably wouldn't do that consistently. I do like this. I can do that consistently. So when you're first getting started, what you're looking for is something that you can do, something that you enjoy doing, and something that you will do regularly and keep doing and not stop. And eventually you start doing that, you'll find something else or you'll add to it and you'll kind of grow with it. So finding something that is interesting, finding something that you feel like um, allows you to have success each time you do it. That's why I really like um, functional movement programs that are designed for beginners to progress. Like my, my, I have a beginner program. If you're a real super beginner person and you're just getting started, you don't know what you can do. Then my beginner program, you sit in a chair and you start moving your body and let's see what's going to work. Right. From there, we can get you out of the chair, try some things from there. We can have you carry household items from there. We can go to resistance bands from there. We can go to dumbbells from there. Like, we can progress. And the idea is start asking yourself, what can I do? Another question to ask is, what are the things in my life that are challenging right now that I don't want to be challenging anymore? One of the biggest things that I hear, um, particularly from my women clients, most of my clients are women, is when it comes to grandkids. My, ki my grandkids come over and I'm watching them it's hard for me to interact because I can't get up and down off the floor. I want to get down on the floor and play with my grandkids. That's my goal. And that has been a goal for many of the women that I work with. And that is something that many of them have become able to do. And it has absolutely changed their life because now they don't dread that time or feel bad about wanting to spend time with their grandkids, but they can't do it the way that they really want to because they can't engage on the same level. Now they can get down on the level with their grandkids, enjoy the time, and then not feel like crap or hurt the whole time for a day or two after the kids left, right? So that's what we're talking about. When we're talking about getting started when you're a senior, it's just what are the things that you want to be able to do? And then how can you make those things easy again? It doesn't have to be in a gym. It can be in your home. It can just be practice getting up and down off the floor more often. If walking up and down the stairs is hard for you and you you really wish it was easy, do it more often. There's a, there's a, a principle in exercise science called, which you've probably heard me talk about, Bob. It, it's called principle, um, specific adaptation to imposed demand. And it's a real simple way. It's a real simple. It's a real complicated way of saying your body will adapt and be able to do the things that you consistently tell it you want it to do. So if you want to walk up and down the stairs better, you have to keep telling your body 
this is what I want you to do. And here's how I want you to do it. And then do it again and then do it again and do it again. And then eventually you're going to do it. You're going to do it 10 times in one day and be like, wow, that wasn't, it wasn't hard at all. Well, that was easy. What's next? And that's the fun part. When you start asking yourself what's next, that's when you know things are going the way you want it to go. Getting back into a few of the other things. Um, so does exercise, do you believe exercise affects your mental health as well as your physical health? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And there's, a, there's, there's a psychological and then there's a biological. So on the biological side of things, um, exercise activates hormones and it activates proteins and it activates enzymes that do all sorts of things to our body. Um, it increases our mental awareness. It increases our ability to learn. It increases our long-term memory. It increases our neural pathways and our body's ability to generate new neural pathways in neurons, which improves brain function. It increases mitochondrial health in the brain. Uh, there's so many different things that physical activity does. It increases autophagy. And then we, we, not even talking about all the metabolic other things, right? All, we talk about all the different things that we can do metabolically, but just from the brain metabolism perspective and brain function, because remember, when we talk about metabolism, we're not talking about fuel, we're talking about function. So when I say brain metabolism, I'm talking about how your brain functions. It is immensely powerful from the biological perspective. On the psychological perspective, I mentioned this earlier, and this is one of the most powerful, powerful things about exercise and having a routine that you're consistent with. Every single time you go to the gym or you go to your basement or you go to your living room to do something that you've committed to yourself to do, you are living a promise and a commitment to face a challenge and overcome it. So you are proving yourself, number one, that you can set a goal and keep it. You are proving to yourself, number two, that you are capable of facing challenges and doing hard things. So every single time you do that, you are reinforcing the habit of overcoming challenge so that when the things that you can't control in life challenge you, you have an experience, you have a scrapbook in your brain of proof and evidence that hard things are possible. And that to me is one of the huge things about exercise and fitness that I, I think we don't talk about it enough. Getting back to this whole fat versus protein thing yeah, um, that we talked about earlier. So do you count macros and do you recommend people count macros? Are macros nutrition or are they just something to make somebody <laughs> You're setting stumble? me up? You're setting me up for that one because you know my answer to that one. Macros are not nutrition, um, but macros are part of the process of helping you manage your nutrition. And, you know, one of the other things that I say all the time is if you're not tracking, you're not trying. And it is hard. And tracking doesn't have to be. People hear the word tracking and they start freaking out. I got to weigh everything. I do it. In some cases, I highly recommend that you do that. You weigh everything and you put your macros down and you set a goal or you watch what you're doing. And in, it might just be just to get an idea. Maybe it's not watching what you're doing, but you start tracking just to see what you're doing. And that's the reason we track. Many people have no idea what they're eating. So if the tracking for you is get a scale, get chronometer, weigh every single bite that you put into your mouth, then that's maybe what you need to do. Some people, they just need to take pictures of their food and put it in a log somewhere, put it in their phone. So they have a, a visual. This is what I ate today because I see people all the time. It happens with me. It happens with Coach Nat. We have people that are like, hey, what did you eat today? They tell us what they ate. And then when we look at their log, there's eight things in there that they totally forgot about because they're snacking or they're, they're, they're eating throughout the day or they had this thing, they had that thing because they're eating, they're not aware of what they're eating and what they're putting into their mouth. So if, if you track it, the purpose of that is so that you can build awareness around what you're doing because you can't change what you're doing to do something different if you don't know what you're doing in the first place. So you have to track on some level in order to make a change. So you know what to change, you know, if the change worked and you know how to adjust that change, if you need to continue working on making tweaks to it. 
Okay, and one more quick question here that I get asked a lot, and I do already know your answer to this, but <laughs> I'm going to ask the question anyway. So does eating fat make you fat? <laughs> it can. <laughs> um, oh, my gosh. How much time do we got? Yes, eating fat does not make you fat, and it can make you fat. Uh, fat, this is going to really, this is really going to drive people crazy. Fat, just like carbs, aren't the problem. Carbs aren't necessarily the problem. Fat isn't the problem. Protein's not the problem. What's the problem is the source of what you're getting, why you're doing it, what it's doing to you, and how you're responding to it. Okay? Um, yes. In most cases, people will see benefit from cutting out carbs. We're not even going to get into that. That's that's pretty much flat out. I don't eat them. I mean, I don't focus on my carbs, right? I don't try to get any carbs in for the day. I get carbs with my eggs, some carbs with my protein powder when I do that, things like that. Not, not, nothing crazy. Um, I think we're all pretty much on the same sheet of music when it comes to carbs. Carbs themselves aren't necessarily bad. Processed food and seed oils are probably worse than a sweet potato. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> yeah. That's kind of where I'm coming from in that discussion. When it comes to fat, the idea that you have to eat fat in order to be fat adapted is functionally wrong. The idea that um, eating unlimited amounts of fuel, because fat is a lot of fuel, most of it is primarily used for fuel. Um, more than your body needs is not going to increase your fat on your body doesn't functionally make sense either. Okay. So the idea is, and I'll see if I can, what I hear a lot and, and in the discussion, um, there's a lot, there's people out there right now saying that, you know, just eat as much fat as you want. Your body will get rid of it. Your body won't allow you to overeat fat. Um, that is patently wrong because it will, it, it, I see it in hundreds of people every day in my clients and other people that I, that I'm, that I'm, uh, colleagues with in the space, we see it happen all the time. Uh, your body has a couple things it can do with fat. And one of the things is store it. If you have too much, I mean, how do you think, I, Body fat is not created just by carbs. Body fat is also created by excess fat. So when we eat a lot of fat, our body has to do something with it. Uh, it doesn't turn it all into ketones. Okay. Uh, it can turn some of it, but it won't turn all of it. And it, because again, how much fuel do you need? Uh, if your body, if you're running at, you know, a three, four, five on your ketone meter all the time, it's probably a sign that you're also going to start gaining body fat sooner rather than later because ketones are excess fuel. And if you're eating a lot of fat and getting a lot of high ketone numbers all the time, and your ketones are never low. That means you've got fuel that your body's not using. I'm probably blowing some people's minds right now, right? Because everybody wants those high ketone numbers. If you have high ketone numbers, you basically have unused fuel floating around in your blood. How is unused fuel, if it's ketones, any better than unused glucose if it's, or unused fuel if it's glucose? What's the difference? And, and that's something that I, I have not had anybody be able to explain to me. You know, we want low glucose. We don't want spikes. We don't want high blood sugar. And being in a higher level of ketosis or people who have therapeutic needs, brain injuries, multiple sclerosis, things like that can be beneficial. And it may even be beneficial for Alzheimer's and dementia and some other autoimmune issues and things like that. But that doesn't mean long-term it's what you're looking for. There are phases, there are specific use cases and there are things where it can be beneficial. But even in those cases, and this is also something people don't talk about a lot, even in those cases, it's recommended that people in those situations break ketosis 
and let their bottles, bodies settle down from having high levels of, levels of ketone 24 7 a day, 24 7 a week, 24 7, whatever, 24 7. Um, so the idea that uh, fat in abundance is good is flawed in the way I think some people are implementing it. This is the, the, the long and short of it. Now, we have come to that point in the interview where I say, Coach, you are sitting in front of my audience, which is demographically 60 plus. Sure. Um, just take a few moments and talk about anything I have forgotten to ask you. And also take a few moments and give your primary message. What do you want to say to the world? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think we covered a lot. There's so many things we could cover. Uh, just the, you know, and I'll just say, we'll bring it all together in what my message is. My message is that fitness is important. Fitness is important because it is your conduit to personal physical freedom. And fitness is accessible. It is possible for anybody at any age, at any condition to do something that will improve their fitness. And once you get started, you're not going to want to stop. Once you get a taste of that, of what physical freedom is, trust me, guys, it's not going, it's not going to get, it's not going to get any uh, easier to stop than you think it is, right? So get started. It's hard. I know it's, it's change. I know you have a, an expectation of I've got to do all these things. And I think part of that message of is that, is that it's accessible is Throw away any perception you th about what you think getting in shape is about. Okay, we have a lot of fear and anxiety about what we think it's going to be about. And then once we get started, we realize it was none of that. It's just about what is best for you in your life right now. You don't have to do anything. That's the biggest thing I want to, I want to take home. You don't have to go to the gym. You don't have to lift weights. You don't have to do any particular program. The only thing you have to do is find something that you're willing and able to do that you're going to enjoy and do consistently that's going to help you get better every day. There are no parameters. Nobody's watching you. Nobody's judging you. Nobody's going to yell at you if you do this versus that. Find something and just start doing 1% more every day. 1% is all it takes. Get outside your comfort zone. When we get outside our comfort zone, we don't have to jump as far as possible outside the comfort zone. All we have to do is take one step outside. We automatically started moving in the direction we want to go, right? So don't expect that. Don't have this perception or expectation that you've got to do this grandiose thing. People want to jump into challenges and jump into this program and jump into that. And then they get smacked in the face like, what the heck did I just do? You know, it doesn't take all that. It just takes one step in front of the other every single day. Okay. Well, thank you for your time today, Coach. Before I let you go, be sure and tell us all the things about the stuff so that we can find you. I know you've got a, a YouTube channel. You've got yep. a website. You've written a book. You've got an app out there that people can sign up with, yep. all kinds of stuff. So tell us all about the things and stuff of Coach yeah. Bronson. Sure. So you can find everything at CoachBronson.com. Um, I've got my YouTube channel linked there. My book is linked there. The book is The Ultimate Ketogenic Fitness Book. You can get that on Amazon. If you are if you speak Spanish or Dutch, it's in Spanish or Dutch on there too. Um, and my YouTube channel is Coach Bronson as well. Uh, and that's pretty much it outside of speaking. Um, I'll be on the low carb cruise next year. If you, you should go on a cruise, Bob. You should, totally go, stuff like that. You should totally go on a cruise. It'd be a blast to have you on there for a week. Yeah, it, it would be, it would be fun, but I can't afford stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's uh if anybody is interested, it's low carb cruise.com. I believe it's may, or I think it's in may this year. Uh, actually it's like Memorial day week, Memorial day weekend. Um, Caribbean. Um, it's going to be great. We got a bunch of different people, Ben Bickman, the, uh, uh, Dr. Diagost, I can never say his last name, Diagostino, a um, bunch of other people are going to be there. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. 
Okay. Well, thanks for being here today, Coach. Everybody, don't forget, get down in the comments. Thank Coach Bronson for his time. If you're not already, I can't imagine that you're not already subscribed to him, but if you're not, be sure and get over there and subscribe to his channel because he brings knowledge like this on a pretty regular basis on his YouTube channel. Don't forget, folks, get out there, be 1% better today, tomorrow, every day. Have a great day, folks. We'll see you in the next one.